in this forum series. Um, if you don't mind, I might begin with a personal question. Um, one of the conclusions in your book, Forged in Crisis, The Making of Five Courageous Leader, which Howard Schultz describes as the most important, coherent, values-based values, values -based servant leadership book he's ever read. Uh, one of those conclusions is that leaders were made and not born. And you are a leader yourself. And I thought it might be interesting for our audience to just hear a little bit. Um, you know, you, you, you weren't born as an endowed chair of Harvard Business School. You, <laughs> you found your way there. Uh, just tell us a little bit about where you grew up and what led you to um, uh, becoming uh, a, a historian at the business school. Um, uh, so, well, the first, thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be here. I'm a big fan and member of the museum and um, just a very enthusiastic resident of Concord. I came here seven years ago after trying to find a place to live for 10. And so it's just such a dream come true to live in this place for all kinds of reasons, including the history. Um, so I was born in Chicago and my father was a faculty, was a faculty member of philosophy professor. My mother was a librarian. We moved around a lot in the in the 1960s and early 70s. I lived in Texas, in Dallas. I lived in Orono, Maine, at the University of Maine, where my dad taught. And eventually, my family settled down in central Illinois, in a place called Bloomington, Illinois. And my father was tenured there at the university. And I went to high school, public high schools. I was public schools all the way. Um, there was never any money and uh, and to send me anywhere else. And I ended up getting to Stanford because. Uh, they gave me enough money to go without a huge debt load. And I went there never having visited, never having been to California with, you know, these like boxes of stuff packed up in my Sears and Roebuck dress. And I think clogs at the time and, you know, and, and started my career at Stanford, my academic career as a serious student in high school, athlete, uh, editor, a uh, very serious student. And, and I ended up in a great books program, a residential great books program, terribly unpolitically correct now, but the curriculum has been updated. And we started with the pre-Socratics and we ended with Sartre and we read everything in between. And I, it taught me to read and to write and to think critically. And it was an astounding education that I draw on every single day of my life. There's not a day when I don't draw on some aspect of that, of not only the, the, the experience of learning and thinking and looking at the world and in such a powerful and interesting and curious way, but also a few dear friends, girlfriends who are still dear, I'm close to. And you know, we've spent a lot of time on Zoom together and during the pandemic. And then I went to graduate school at Kennedy School and got a two-year master's in public policy, very quantitative. That was very difficult for me. I spent a year figuring out what I was going to do next after I worked for a year in Washington for Gary Hart, who was then a rising charismatic, handsome star in the Democratic Party. This was all long before monkey business or in the lead up to monkey business. And then I decided I hadn't had enough of thinking about the most important questions that men and women have been grappling with and decided to do a degree in history. And I didn't have a lot of historical background with my education. And I ended up again for money reasons at Harvard, which was a fantastic, a fantastic place for me. And I loved graduate school. I just, I knew I was there. I wasn't an alienated lost graduate student. I was like a pig in mud. Um, and when I got finished, I taught at Harvard for a few years in the history and literature concentration and in the economics concentration. And then I went to the business school on just it's not even worth going to such a kind of like two roads diverged in a wood. And like, I ended up on the road, you know, with no leaves had trodden black. And I was there. I, I didn't expect to stay, but I stayed and I stayed and I, 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 I grew with the school, but mostly I grew into a, human, a, human, a humanist who also understands how organizations work, mm -hmm. who understands how th where theory meets practice. And once I had tenure, and then my, after I got tenure, my life started falling apart through tragedy. I came out of that place with this deep commitment to understanding leadership in, from a humanist point of view, not from a systems point of view, but from a human point of how do leaders right, forge within themselves the, the, the resilience, the courage, the focus to do something extraordinary. Hmm. Um, and, and the reason I think I came to the topic that way, a lot of it had to do with some earlier work I'd done, I published a bunch of books, 
over time, because I'm a very slow, meticulous researcher and even slower <laughs> writer. Um, but I, I, beginning right after tenure, my, my father dropped dead, my mother collapsed, my husband left me with no warning, just walked out one day after 15 years of marriage. I got breast cancer with no risk factors, mm. went through a very complicated, messy, long divorce, and then got breast cancer again. Mm. Um, you know, Dana Farber, the whole best of care. And, and, and I think, and there were some other really hard things that happened along the way. And there's all this course for about five years. Mm-hmm. And so each time I'd stagger up, stand up, I, I'd fall down on my knees again. And I, and, and I started reading Lincoln. Mm-hmm. This is the end of the answer. Finally, I started reading Lincoln late at night. I didn't know anything about Lincoln. I was trained as a European historian. And the more I read about Lincoln, the more I thought, how did this guy do it? How did he, how, how did he not only how did he lead the nations of the Civil War, but how did he survive? He had so much personal tragedy and so much guilt about the bloodshed of the war. And Lincoln was my way into Forged in Crisis, a book about how leaders are made, particularly powerfully made, during times of great volatility and adversity. So there you go. And um, we should uh, know, I mean, I, I really enjoyed the book, and uh, we're only going to talk about one fifth of it because. Yeah. Uh, you talk about five individuals, Ernest yeah. Shackleton, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass. Um, uh, Dietrich Frederick, bon- Bonhoeffer. Yeah, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, and Rachel Carson. And I heard you in one interview say that um, of the five, Rachel Carson was maybe your favorite or re- that story resonated with you. And again, since we're uh, tying this to our um, Women of Concord exhibit, I thought we'd focus most of our time. But I, I really want to encourage our viewers to read the whole book because all five stories are fascinating, but um, first tell, tell me why, why did that, why did Rachel, why did Rachel Carson's story, you know, resonate so strongly with you? A couple of things, I think. Uh, she was arguably one of the most powerful leaders of the 20th century. You could, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say in any way, shape or form that Silent Spring is, if not the most important book written in English in the 20th century, one of the two or three most important books in terms of the impact that it unleashed and continues to exert on people. I mean, scratch Bill Bill McKibben, scratch Al Gore, talk to E.O. Wilson, talk to all kinds of folks that you know, Tom, and have worked with here at the Kennedy Library in uh, your very interesting, rich career. And they'll tell you, I'm the person I've learned the most from, the person I'm most inspired by, the person I go back to when I lose my way is Rachel Carson. And they'll say that today. Mm -hmm. So um, she was an introvert. You know, she, I, I, I said in a New York Times article I wrote about her many years ago that she preferred walking the coastlines of Maine to walking the corridors of power in Washington, where she rose within the civil service quite high. Um, and, and so I, I'm an introvert and, and I'm a writer more than I am any other single calling or single professional identity. And so I, identif- I, I think I closely identify with that. Her gentleness and her kindness. She was such a gentle and caring person. She spent a great deal of her life caring for members of her family. And she's such a great spotlight on the role that caretaking plays in all, I think, candid assessments, candid, candid leaders. The great leaders are always caretakers, whether they're army sergeants or, you know, or cancer specialists or, or activists or CEOs. And, and so the, her, the caretaking aspect of her was so. Um, was so impressive to me. And yet married to that gentleness and this sense of wonder, lifetime sense of wonder about the world, particularly the natural world, but the world more generally, was this this resilience that she found within herself and then kind of honed and strengthened while she while she took on Silent Spring, which is a complete departure from the best-selling book she'd written in the 1950s, The Sea Around Us, which some of our listeners will remember or have read and, 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 uh, and the edge of the sea. And for her to write this muckracking, incredibly dangerous book, because she was taking on not only Monsanto and Dow and Velsicol and these big chemical companies, she was taking on the United States Department of Agriculture, which is committed millions and millions of dollars and huge amounts of other resources to spraying with heptachlor and DDT and these pesticides. And yet, you know, once she, kind of, as she said, once I discovered the story she wrote to a dear friend of hers, she realized there would be no peace for me um, if I remained silent. And so that, that the combination of that, you know, gentle curiosity and this tenacious, you know, resilience that she found, because, well, something that your, our viewers may not know, or our audience, our participants may not know, is that 
Rachel Carson was diagnosed with very aggressive breast cancer about halfway through the book. Um, and, and she knew she had an ex, went to a second opinion, got an expert uh, uh, diagnosis from a man that some people will remember the name of George Kreil, a real pathbreaker and an oncologist, um, that she was probably not going to live very long. And so to write the book under these circumstances, because she has, there's no chemotherapy, if she'd had chemotherapy, she might have lived, but, but um, to write the book under the kind of circumstances she faced, not only psychological, and not only these, you know, the, the, the threat of what people were getting wind of that she was writing about and the threat she received. And she told almost no one about the cancer because she didn't want critics to think she was on a vendetta, you know, path. Uh, to write this book under those circumstances and to keep on finding the will physical because the, the treatments were debilitating. And there's one moment about eight months into the diagnosis when she's developed this terrible staph infection. She has iritis, so she can't see. She can't, she's confined to a wheelchair from complications of her treatments. And she's sitting in this wheelchair, reading, the, listening to her research assistant, read her pages out loud and editing from that. And, he, and she says, you know, if, if I was a superstitious person, I, I swear dark forces are, are completely conspiring to prevent me from writing this book. But she did. She did right. it. She did. And she did it well. Right. And, and so there's just something to me so appealing about this combination of of, of attributes that she discovered, imported, accessed, and then relied on in her in these years of writing this book. I, I, I read the audio version of the book and everyone that's heard it says, to, you know, you really care about Rachel because your voice is different in that long chapter, that long storytelling. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Huh. Uh, let's go back and um, tell people a little bit more because I think so few know her life story. So, uh, Kind of a hard scrabble upbringing outside of Pittsburgh. Maybe you can uh, tell us that part of her young life. Sure. So her mother actually was well was pretty well educated for women born in the mid nineteenth century, and really homeschooled her children in many different ways. I mean, Rachel graduated valedictorian of a small public high school outside Pittsburgh. Her brother and sister didn't fare didn't fare nearly so well scholastically, and her her father was largely uneducated, um, and and so. She spends her childhood either studying, writing for St. Nicholas, a magazine that most people won't remember, but I vaguely do back to my childhood and, and writing stories. She was very well published by the time she went to college at Chatham College, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania College for Women in Pittsburgh on scholarship with her mother selling the family China, right, to help pay the tuition costs. Um, and, and then she, and so this, this, this childhood of both studying and then, and then discovering the outdoors because her mother was was a kind of you know amateur but very serious naturalist. And so she was today should be called an ecologist. She, she learned a great deal about the natural world before she went to college, but she had this great writing talent that she was you know dedicated to making better. And so she starts off as an English major and then discovers biology and some mentors along the way. And in a very very difficult six months of making decisions, decides against all her mentors' advice, including the president of the college to go into the sciences, because women don't do that, right? That's just, there's, there's a dead end. She decided to become uh, a, a science major and then gets a scholarship to Johns Hopkins uh, and goes off with, with a summer at Woods Hole in between the first time she'd seen the ocean uh, and just get mesmerized by the natural and poetic majesty of the ocean um, or the scientific majesty of the ocean and, and ends up at Johns Hopkins. Now we are, what, she's born in 19... Oh, seven, so it's now 1930, and the Great Depression is just right. arrived. And so that's, that's where her adult life begins. Her, her birth family, um, struggling outside of Pittsburgh to make ends meet, comes to live with her outside of Baltimore. And so she is now thrust in this position where she's trying to keep her family afloat financially, trying to finish, begin a, a PhD dissertation. She gets her master's in the first two years. Um, and and she's got an, a sister with kids, a mother, a brother, a father. And, and and so she is thrown into this caretaking role that's very, very important um, and trying to piece together the finance. And she has to drop out of graduate school in the early 1930s. It's a wrenching decision. Um, and, and But she makes it. And then she looks for part time teaching work. And eventually in 37, her father drops dead in the backyard. There's no money. There's so little money in the family at that time. 
that his that she and her mother packed the body off to send it to Pittsburgh where his sisters can afford to bury. I mean, it's it's really down to the wire. A neighbor dropped in during that time and said the family was sitting down to dinner and in front of the dinner table was a bowl of apples and everyone had a knife around the table to eat. Um, and and she eventually gets a job. It's a series of, you know, like all her, her lives, it's, you know, serendipity and, and, and volition. And, and she ends up working for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And she has this unique set of gifts at this point. She has this writing ability and she has all this scientific background. And she marries right, the rigors of science with the ability to make those rigors not only accessible, but really captivating for audiences. And she begins writing radio scripts for the Fish and Wildlife Service and then starts writing freelance stuff for the Baltimore Sun and the Saturday Evening Post and the Ladies Home Journal. And so that is her career, really, for the next 20 years in different ways with interruptions and the book that goes nowhere, first book that goes nowhere because it's published the week before Pearl Harbor is bombed. Um, and that's her career where she she's doing this combination of caretaking for her family, just like every woman knows what I'm talking about, right? Get home at six, put dinner on the table, put the laundry in the wa- in the rear washer uh, and, and, and begin to get the kids ready for bed. Her right. nieces grow up and then actually have one of them has children of her own. And, and at the same time, she's writing freelance articles and working on different projects and meeting all kinds of scientists and fisher, fisher, fishermen and all kinds of natural experts for her job. And she's marrying all these things in her work, not only the science and the writing, not only the field work and, and, the, and the laboratory work. She's marrying the sense of, of, of caring and fiduciary responsibility for, 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 the, for the natural world. And that, the, that's really the eye beams or the buttresses of, of what will become Silent Spring, although she doesn't see it right. that way. Right. In, the yeah. early, in the early 50s, she publishes a bestseller called The Sea Around Us, which frees her financially, from, makes her famous in all kinds of ways, wins every kind of science and literary award it can win, spends 80 weeks on the best, top of the bestseller list, New York Times bestsellers. And, and then she's, and that frees up some time. And, and, and so, it's, it's into that void, in a sense, that, that the pesticide, the, the mass spraying of DDT becomes hers, comes one, to her t- One of the lessons um, that wrote um, the five case studies, uh, you talk about the gathering years. So maybe just yeah. talk a little bit more generally about why that's an important uh, role that you see for all five leaders and what yeah. you mean by that term. So what are our listeners and viewers may not know is that I, the book is a storybook. The reason it's easy to read is because it's just a storybook. It's the story of these people's journeys, but interlaced woven in without bullet points or cutaway boxes or anything. because That's not how historians write it, even though that's some of the business school folks do. And they don't really understand what I do, but um, it are these things they learned along the way. Um, and because I was trained to Harvard business school, I feel no historical compunction about bringing those to the attention of, all kinds of leaders today, including mothers and fathers. And one of the things she figures out in really in her in her late 20s and early 30s is that a whole, that, that a whole bunch of there are times in our life, women understand this really well, particularly women working outside the home, because women are always working, um, is that is that there are times when you're not crossing anything off the list, when the resume isn't getting any longer, when there's no bucket list items that you have any agency over, so to speak. I'm using modern terminology, but she would have understood perfectly. She wrote about it. And, and that there, that doesn't mean that you're not, that you're not gathering, that you're not, you know, that, you're, that the bank of, or if you will, the, the repository of who you're becoming isn't getting plenty of deposits, let's put it that way. Uh, and, and she understands that. And that comes to be, you know, her notebooks, her writings, that comes to be, again, part of this unshakable foundation that she's going to build in Silent Spring. And I, I tell it to young people, Tom, all the time. Some of my young people in the Harvard Business School online courses I'm teaching, some of my MBAs, some of the college students I've taught at Harvard. And it's, they find it comforting, I think. It's real, but I, I'm glad they find it comforting because there's so much pressure in our you know, social media age, our just-in-time age to get it done now and be sure what you're doing is as important as what everyone else is talking about on social media. And that's that's just not, I think, those just aren't the, 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 the really important flagstones of, 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 a, of a thoughtful life that we build to be proud of. There are lots of moments when it doesn't mean nothing's happening to who we're becoming and all kinds of good stuff isn't taking root, but we're not necessarily harvesting that stuff 
in what society currently regards as credibly demonstrable ways. It's not about when, as David Foster Wallace once said, these are moments that are not about winning, displaying, and achieving. It doesn't mean they're not very important. And um, again, the C around this, which I happen to have my copy on the God bless you. there. Um, I mean, it really is more of a poem. Uh, yeah. And at that point, she's really an artist with, you know, painting beautiful images with words. Um, so then let's move to um, actually Benjamin Spock's daughter who yeah. uh, alerts her to tell us that story. Yeah, so Benjamin, Marjorie Spock, Benjamin Spock's daughter writes her, or actually tells her, gets involved in a lawsuit on Long Island because lots and lots of animals were dying in these mass aerial spraying campaigns. DDT had been used uh, extensively during the Second World War to spray for malaria carrying mosquitoes and been very successful eradicating mosquitoes. Um, it's the first combat war in history where more people don't die of disease than of, than of bullet wounds. More people die of bullet wounds in World War II um, or bombs. And, and so she's curious about this. And actually, she, and, and then another woman um, from Duxbury, Olivia Huxley, who had been a columnist for the Boston Globe and knew her or knew of her, writes her and tells her about her robins dropping out of trees. They're dying in the bird bath because of this terrible DDT. And so she's interested, right? She's a scientist. She knows a little bit about chemical, about these chemicals. Um, and she actually tries to, to, to get, she's done a lot of serialization and writing for the New York under um, William Sean's editorship. And she try, and she knows E.B. White, right? Who many of us know as the author of Charlotte's Web. We've written a lot of natural stories, it's natural stories as well. And she says, here, Mr. White, this is a great story for you. And White wants nothing to do it. Too hot to handle. He's like, no, 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 you, you take this. You take this. And, and after some tentative letter writing to people she knows, because she knows lots and lots of people now. She's been doing this. She was, in, you know, she was a G17 and she worked for you know 20 years, almost 20 years in the government. Um, so she, after some letters go out and she gets some very interesting information from experts, she decides there's something I gotta follow. And she, she just starts putting, she follows it like a detective. And that's not the way she also works. Um, and, and the deeper she gets into it, the more convinced she is that all is not well here. And, and that's the beginning. And, and, but, but, the, but the Marjorie Spock actually launched with some other plaintiffs, launches a lawsuit against the chemical company. And, and I think a second complainant was the U.S. government or certainly this, the, the local government. And, 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 Rachel goes through the testimony like with a fine tooth comb. She's very, very good researcher, very good detective. And she and, and that's where that's really the spark that ignites what she reads there before she starts a letter writing and inquiries is the spark that, that really ignites her interest. Well, it's interesting because one wonders if E.B. White rejected it, not only because it's too hot to handle, but he probably understood the level of painstaking research that would be required. Yeah. And she she knew that she her facts had to be unshakable. Um, just talk a little bit about the research that she did and what she was up against. So um, she she's up again. She's got to figure out what's the what, what, where's the truth here, right? She's like any good scholar. What's the truth? Not a truth. Mm -hmm. Not the Republican Party's truth. Not the Democrat. <laughs> the, the truth, right? right? We've gotten away from understanding what it took a hundred years of enlightenment work and a thousand years before that to understand that we, there's, the truth exists and we, we're, we're meant to look for it and, and do our very best to verify it. Um, once we think we've discovered it or found it or uncovered it through painstaking research. So she, the, the research turns out to be quite complicated. First of all, you got to figure out what these, what these chemicals are. They've been hastily manufactured and hastily commercialized. They're all, all in great haste, seven years, eight years. It's not a very long, this isn't a very long timeline. And then you have to figure out what is their effect on the, the, the species they're trying to kill. And then you have to figure out, and, and, and is, there, is there a Darwinian natural selection, antibiotic kind of effect where animal species m multiplying as fast and as often as these species do, mosquitoes, just take mosquitoes, for example, or fire ants, E.O. Wilson first got interested in DDT because he knew so much about fire ants. Um, and they were some of the early populations of bug spray. Uh, you have to figure out, is there, is there a way in which the species can quickly, under the laws of natural selection, mutate enough that they, are, they grow you know, more and more immune, like our bodies do to antibiotics when used in large and frequent right. doses. And so she has to figure that out. But then there's all these other really important pieces. So 
piece of the chemicals. And then there's this big piece about, well, what is their effect on, on animal life? What is their effect in air? What is their effect on water? What is their effect on the food supply? Because it turns out that this stuff is being sprayed on fruit and baby food was discovered. They were just Gerber and other baby food manufacturers were discovering trace amounts and then more than trace amounts in applesauce. What, you know, what is the effect on, the, on, on human physiology? She didn't do so much work on animal physiology, but even before she knew cancer, she was hard at work trying to discover um, whether there was an effect on, on, on cell reproduction in the, in the human body. And this takes her months and months and months. So she has to educate herself on, on cell mutation in the human body, something she has not spent a great deal studying. And, and, and she goes to all these experts around the world. I mean, the thing that's so amazing, if you look at her notes, is all these carbon copies of the letters she wrote. And she can't send off an email or a text, but she writes all, and it's not mostly phone calls, it's letters. Letter, thousands of letters to many of whom, many of whom respond because they know her work and respect it. This is back to doing your homework and the gathering years and the kind of, if you will, track record she brings to the table here with other experts. And they write back some at great danger, danger of their own jobs and start help spilling the beans about what they know. And so the cancer piece, which occupies really three chapters of Silent Spring takes her almost a year, way more than she thought. Everything takes longer than she thought. And this is before she gets sick. Everyone knows this, the writes, you know, everything takes longer. Her, this takes, because the research takes so much longer. And then the writing takes so much longer. Anyway, um, the, the research is meticulous. And there's a great line in the book from one of her, she has two research assistants that work with her. All the rest she's doing by herself. And, and one of the younger women, they're both younger women, they become her good friends. Um, writes, you know, I just didn't understand it. It was like the story of the tortoise and the hare, right? I, I couldn't imagine why this was taking so long, why she was plodding and why the living room was filled with these boxes of index cards and she's cross-checking all this stuff and sending all these drafts out to get comments by mail from other experts and rewriting and re I just, and it took me a long time to realize what was happening and how careful and wise what she was doing was. But I certainly, it frustrated the heck out of me for the first year I worked for. And that's, and you know, and she's constantly writing her Boston-based editor, Paul Brooks of Houghton Mifflin. I need some more time, Mr. Brooks, or I need some more time, Paul. And, and so what was supposed to be done in 1960, you know, takes another really two full years for her to finish. And some of that's health, but the bulk of it, the bulk of it is how long it took her to do the research and then to figure out how to explain that research to the lay reader, to what you would call the curious, her curious reader, her cit a citizen, because she's really writing. No one, no one talks about Silent Spring as a as a political pamphlet, but it's. I mean, she's she's right up there with Tom Paine and Timothy Snyder from Yale, our new pamphleteer, about writing about a call to action. It's a call to action, but first you educate people, and if you give them the good stuff, they will rise to the to the call to citizen action. And there's an incredible backlash. Uh, I like the line that someone wrote, silent spring led to a very noisy yes. summer. Um, to describe, uh, give a couple of the anecdotes of what was said about her uh, by the- Yeah, sure. I mean, it's so, it's so and, and by the Secretary of Agriculture at the time who said, right, why, because there's a whole pe a big piece of silent spring. Think about Greta Thunberg today, right? It's talking about the future, right? You're, you're, you're using up all these resources, you're contaminating the, the, the climate today, what about the future? What about future generations? And she keeps talking about the moral, she drops this kind of moral gauntlet about not only what does it mean for the other interconnected, fragile and, 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 and strong web of life that man is the most powerful determinant of, but what does it mean for our kids' kids, our kids and their kids? And, and the Secretary of Agriculture writes, what does she care about the, the future? She's a spinster. You know, and he says that in front of a bunch of telephone, television cameras. And then there are, there are death threats or all kinds of legal threats from, from chemical companies. There are all kinds of articles about his female hysteria and her hysteria about the natural world and about these chemicals. Um, and and it, it, it just, it reminds you of you know, how cruel, right, fame can be in terms of the bullseye that, you know, that all kinds of people, uh, particularly people taking on vested interests, can find themselves serving as right a bullseye, and and she and she's and that happens to her. The 
the headline, Silent Spring, Noisy Summer, is a New York Times headline because the book was serialized, Sean serialized in New Yorker against all kinds, again, legal threats. The, the corporate counsel for the New Yorker said, every fact's been checked time and time again. Tell them, go ahead and sue. And I like to say that because of all the threatened lawsuits, none was ever brought mm-hmm. against Silent Spring. So you know she, she did what she set out to do with all that time and all that care which was set the book on the, set the, the argument of the book, all an unshakable foundation. One other interesting thing about the book that's worth mentioning to, to our folks here is that she organized it. You said, you know, there's so much poetry. It, you know, the see around this is like a long poem. Well, she said once before, before the Kaiser Foundation, she said, if there's poetry in my books, it's because there's poetry in science. It's not science doesn't, we don't put the poetry in the science, it's there. <laughs> If right. you're looking, if you're looking keenly at the natural world. And, and, and so, you know, she had to, a poet has to figure out how to organize a book on chemical compounds and their effects on, on, on the world we live in, the air we breathe. And she organizes it ironically around frost. Maybe that's why I used the analogy earlier about words to yeah. word about around two roads diverging in a wood. And she's you know, along one road, now less traveled, lies the possibility of a sustainable relationship with the natural world on which we all depend. And along another road, easier, faster, seemingly more convenient, lies disaster. And so she keeps organizing, coming back to that trope in, in, in laying out the story. It's, it's, if you haven't read the book, it's a great read. It's an amazingly good read. In, in your book, you write about how, uh, again, she has all the facts straight, but mm-hmm. she moves from an understanding of the facts to uh, a deeper wisdom. And uh, I've heard you speak about the program she was on on CBS Reports, mm-hmm. which was the 60 minutes of the time, yes. and she's debating someone. Maybe you can uh, explain and, and how There's, memorable that. Yeah, was. sure. I mean, if you have, you can you can Google this, folks, if you're interested. You want to see Rachel? She's pretty sick then and she's very careful to hide her cancer she's wearing a wig she's only doing appearances even though she becomes incredibly famous where she feels like she can have a big impact so she testifies before congress she does have a major legislative impact while she's alive um but she's very careful about her appearances because she's quite ill and she knows she's going to die soon and um this is the spring of 63 and she's on eric severide for many of you may remember that name is the interviewer and he's, they organized the program a little bit like 60 minutes today an interview with a chemist from Belsicle, I think it's Belsicle, and, and then an interview with Rachel, and they kind of cut back and forth between this. And, and it's really, you know, a three-round fight, and Rachel wins it in the knockout. It's just so incredible, and she's so calm, and she's so careful, and she's so graceful about the way she says things. But she says, she says this, a couple of things I want to mention that she says that she doesn't say anywhere else. I think we're so powerful for our time uh, and the, the trouble we've gotten ourselves in with our devices and our in our busyness. Um, and she says, you know, we're not called on here to master nature, but to master ourselves, which I just think is such a, such an astounding way of cutting to the chase about environmental sustainability and many other aspects of our, of the incredibly urgent challenges we face right now. But then she says something else and she writes a bit of this in Silent Spring, but she says a little more eloquently. She said, you know, have we fallen in, think about the relevance of this today, have we fallen into a mesmerized state that allows us to accept what we know to be detrimental or harmful to ourselves or our communities because we have lost the will to demand what is good? It's so powerful. And what Silent Spring is, is a, is a gauntlet dropped in front of each of us to demand what we know is good. And, and it's really, really a great pamphlet. And the fact that she has so much faith in her fellow citizens, this introvert, this beach walker, this woman who never married, but had dear close friendships with a number of people and who adopted her grand nephew when she was 50, he was six. Um, you know, it's just to me, so such a testimony to the power of the human spirit and what we can make of ourselves and that spirit if we put our mind to rising to the challenge. So I'll uh, get to the conclusion of your book. Uh, I do want to talk about civil rights leaders, and we encourage um, our viewers to ask questions. So uh, <laughs> the first lesson is that leaders are made and not born. Just tell us a little bit about what you mean by that. 
So leisure may not born. I mean, I, I have a recipe for that if I can just offer it because I stole it from A.G. Lafley, who's a friend, you know, alumnus of the school. I got to know him trying to raise money for the school. Pro, uh, former two-time CEO of Procter & Gamble. And I made this movie many years ago when I thought I was going to write a book about Lincoln, just what the world needs, another book about Lincoln. But I, went, I made a movie about leadership lessons of Lincoln. I went and interviewed all these CEOs about what they thought they'd learned from Lincoln. And everyone had something to say, which was interesting in itself. And Lafley said, look, he said, look, leaders are, are, are made, they're not born, and they're made from these three ingredients. And I have to tell you, this is like 2005. And this is just such a powerful conception to me. He said, they're made of first ingredient, a combination of nature and nurture. Right, our endowments, our gifts, the things we, the health we come into the world with, married to the mileage we accumulate on the odometer of life, the nurture. I mean, the the nurture part, and that's one ingredient: nature and nurture. The second ingredient is that a moment arises that an individual, maybe without ever realizing it before, demands their leadership. This was what the silent spring gauntlet was for her. You know, E. B. White says no. She says there would be no peace for me if I kept silent. Moment arises that demands their leadership. But the third ingredient, and Lafley would tell you very, you know, with great conviction, that verve, that these are all equally important. The third ingredient is that the individual, for him or herself, has to decide to embrace the cause and get in the game. And it's only been in the last couple of months teaching a bunch of executives at Harvard Business School that I realized what that embrace is. It's, and I think I have it now. And I think it's true of all the people I say, I studied, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've studied a lot of living and dead leaders, past and present. And they all, when they when they end up embracing a big cause that that you know really that that motivates them, partly motivates them to make make themselves capable of an extraordinary thing, even if they hadn't been before that. Most of these people hadn't been. Maybe Frederick Douglass is an exception, but none of these other people, Lincoln included, is an exception. The, the embrace of the cause is some kind of alignment between what they suddenly discover or suddenly can access their deepest values in relation to their best self, their stronger self, aligned with a purpose. So there's Carson putting it all together over this study that she has no idea is going to be so taxing, doesn't know she's going to have cancer in the middle of it, called Silent Spring. But those three ingredients, I think, are really important, right? The nature and nurture, the moment that a leader says, I, I'm needed, I got to do this, and then the embrace of the cause and the alignment between the external stage and who I'm meant to, meant to become at my best. And you say um, she almost learns to be brave, but as yeah. things go on, she gets braver over time. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I've done a lot, not a lot, but enough work to teach uh, the leadership journey of Nelson Mandela, which is really interesting. Mandela is the famous author of this quote, which he used many times in different forms. Here's the quote. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's the willingness to walk into the fear and discover that not only you're still standing, but you can in that in that standing, you can triumph over it. Not in a huge dramatic Hollywood way, but just by virtue of the fact that, okay, I'm here. And just by walking into the fear, whatever it is, having the difficult conversation, you know, getting on the fresh horse, you know, going into the, the march where the cops are aligned out the outside or the Ku Klux Klan is there, as it was so meant for often in the civil rights movement. Um, that even doing that, doing that. Right, mm -hmm. dissipate some of the fear. And Carson, and by the way, like a muscle, resilience and courage, right, get stronger with use. Partly because you're like, well, I dealt with that a month ago. I can deal with this. Right. And, and that really, I think, is exactly what you're saying, Tom, that she taught herself to be brave and she got braver and braver as she went. Um, I also like the quote, I think it's Gandhi's, that um, uh, my life is my message. Yes, and she sure. certainly kind of captures that how she lived her life and what she yeah. wrote. And, yeah. So, and you know, people like, I, I, I've done a lot of work on women leaders. I mean, I think about Marion Wright Edelman. She's another person, starts off as a civil rights activist, by the way, yeah. meets her husband in that struggle and, and then becomes active on pov any poverty work. I mean, she's like that. You know, I, I think uh, Gloria Steinem, there's so many people, women for whom my life is my message. And my own sense is that these people who find this, find this mission that's so important to them, so aligned, in, aligned inside with who they are and then outside with what the world needs and what and to move the boulder of goodness forward, that they actually lead very rich, very full lives. It's not about happiness. It's about satisfaction, abiding satisfaction and the, and, and the power of that mission to keep motivating not only them, but lots of other people as well. And, and, and putting people together in a, in a connected way as well.
personal pace. I heard you used that term before of moving the boulder of goodness yes. forward. So let's talk about the civil rights movement. Um, first, what led you, what, what had you decide to do your next round or your next book and round of research on the civil rights leaders? So I, I've been casting about for a couple of years for the next book. I, I'm really slow. Like Rachel, I'm just going to, you know, overturning like my dog sniffing around the meadow right looking for stuff i was i was going to try and write a book interestingly enough they'll be interested in this for this exhibition I mean, just apropos of you know every path laid open was a book on the women abolition i mean the women abolitionists of concord yeah. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. really interesting group of people and they brought frederick douglas here a couple of, D- D- douglas didn't come here they brought douglas here and <laughs> right. women carried what well, this is on the white and black women carried the abolition movement through a lot of troughs in, in, in Massachusetts and several other places as well. It's not a well-known story. But believe it or not, the paperwork for the kind of work I do, I need journals. I do internal stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm writing about the leaders, you know, the journey inside them and how they, how they rise to the occasion. That's what I do. It's my unique perspective on leadership. I'm not leaving it anytime soon. you got to have really good sources, and they just don't exist here. For me to do that. So I'm casting about, I've written about Lincoln, I've written about Douglas. I'm fascinated in, in the in the in, in the campaign for equality and justice last spring with like it's you know, I'm a historian, I'm like hell's bells. There is still such an underbelly to the American experiment. And here we are, we've made a lot of progress. No one, lots of people don't know that because they don't know what, what life was like in 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama. Right. There's no real progress made, but there's so far to go, and my God, it's time. And I, and then I, John Lewis dies, and I think I'm going to write a case on John Lewis. Whatever business school, you got to educate all these business leaders about John Lewis. And the more I dig into the civil rights movement, the more I realize that this story is so unbelievably interesting, so rich, so full of courage and seriousness and honor, and and human beings and their growth. I mean, and 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 finding your courage muscles. And, and there, there is the documentation there. And, and so I, I, I'm not going to do Lewis. I'm not going to do King. We know lots about those people. I'm going to I'm going to do a book. I think I probably can't resist doing a book by several people. But this right. book isn't going to be about the single leader chapter by chapter. It's going to be about leadership and fellowship. It's going to be about how together. Right. Three, five people, how they did, how, how much strength they drew from the collective in different groupings. Right. SNCC. CORE, the Congress on Racial Equality, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, not so much the NAACP, but uh, but because they were a legal tack that was yeah. largely distinct from the civil rights. So, so that's what I'm doing. And it's it's just an embarrassment. It's so interesting. It's so relevant. The lessons they learned strategically are so incredibly important for the next phase of the campaign for justice and equality. It, it's crazy, They're critical. Though. They're critical, in fact. They're critical. These lessons right. have to be looked at. By, yeah. by today's activists. I'm absolutely no expert, but it, one uh, clear difference is um, many of them don't have the gathering years because as David Havelstam wrote, they were children. I mean, they were, you know, college students. And um, let's maybe talk about Diane Nash. She got involved oh, as a college student in Nashville. She was probably 19, 20 years she was old. Nine, yeah, she was. She was 19. She was, and, and she was incredibly instrumental at, at several what I call kind of choke point moments of the civil rights movement. If you haven't run into her, my dear listeners and dear dear viewers, let me just recommend you do a quick, even just Google search. There's not, not a great deal written about her because she's a woman. Um, as opposed to, there are you know a number of books on John Lewis and there's all kinds of books on Martin Luther King uh, and a lot of books about the civil rights movement more generally. Right? Halberstam's book is very good, by the way, if you're looking for a, a single yeah. good book. And so is Lewis's memoir. It's very good, Walking with the Wind. Uh, and Andrew Young's book, an, an, an Easy Burden, is phenomenal. I'm just about three quarters of the way through it. Um, and he was pivotal and not always understood to be as important as he was. But but um, Diane Nash was a, a student at Fisk. She had transferred from Howard to a middle class Chicago, uh, African American, Black American family. And she gets interested in the sit ins in 1960. Um, and actually gets interested in some of the sit in activity happening before that. We know about the Nashville and the Greensboro sit ins, but there were sit ins in 1959 as well. And, and she gets interested in that and, and gets increasingly active. Um, in the nonviolent movement, which was running initially in parallel with the sit-in movement um, with with a guy named James Lawson, who many of you may have heard 
speak at John Lewis's funeral last July, um, he's astounding, uh, just an astounding, un, largely unrecognized um, leader in the civil rights movement. Did all the um, trainings of these all students. the nonviolent training. So no one, even the kids in the Birmingham campaign that you see on the other end of the fire hose spigot, even those kids were spent half a day learning some of these techniques of how not to resist and how to keep moving when you were attacked. Um, so you could claim the moral high ground and so that the television cameras would capture a certain image that was politically and morally so very, very powerful. Not to mention the spiritual underpinnings of this, you know, this was very important for Diane Nash, right? Um, that, and for all, mo almost all of the leaders of the civil rights movement, that you are really meant to look your opponent in the eye, even if he's hitting you as an orange crate, as John Lewis did uh, in Montgomery when he was beaten almost senseless um, in, during the Freedom Rides in 1961, and say, I don't hate you, you are my, you are my friend and you are my brother. Um, and so on every level, this was important. And she was instrumental in not only participating in the civil rights movement, she was jailed some 40 times in her life, but also then in, in leading them and organizing them. She became a leading, a real leader in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And then incredibly important, arguably the most important person in the Freedom Rides, which are these astounding bus rides that were taken in the spring of 1961 to desegregate. Uh, interstate transportation, and which resulted in September of that year, and that happening with an ICC regulation that became very powerful and was enforced. Um, and she's just a linchpin. And and she there's one moment when, in 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 the spring of '61, after some terribly violent attacks on the buses, including a fire bombing that almost kills the the Freedom Riders at Anniston, Georgia, when they everyone wants them to quit, the the organizers want to quit. King, Martin Luther King wants him to quit. Bobby Kennedy, the attorney general, so was, doesn't want any more civil rights mess. It's hurting the Kennedy administration's you know, political agenda. And, and, and she's just like, we can't quit. If we quit now, the rest of our, our, our demonstrations, anything we want to do in the civil rights movement on a nonviolent basis, it will be clear that you can stop us with violence. We absolutely can't quit. And she single-handedly brings these things back to life and organizes the students to get back on the buses and ships them to Montgomery to, to travel to Mississippi where the rides end and they're all jailed. Um, so she's just astounding and she's graceful. If you Google her, if you can see her, see her on the internet, she's active and still speaking. And you can see her in her early nineties and get a sense of the grace and courage and strength of this, this human being then and now. The, um, we gave her an award when I was at the Kennedy library. Said that. I was so thrilled to read that when you told me that. And uh, you can probably, I, I imagine we taped it. Um, but she gave a, almost a little bit of a lecture and it was on <laughs> agape love, which is different than romantic love, the huh? you know, love of uh, other people, a very Christian concept. But yeah. then her son told the story that um, yeah. one time she ended up being a single mom of a complicated relationship with another leader of the civil rights movement. And um, they, it was, I think, in the 70s. And you know, she was at this point kind of out of the movement and raising her son had a but they had just bought a color TV and they were very excited. And um, they came back from church on uh, Sunday and the uh, place had been broken into and someone stole their TV. And he, this, her son told the story at this luncheon and said, she looked at me and she said, we're gonna do two things. We're gonna find that TV. She said, I'm sure it's somewhere, you know, in the- In the, in the neighborhood? In the neighborhood. And she said, and then we're gonna forgive the person who stole it because something motivated them to do this terrible thing that was probably beyond there. And he said, it's just, you know, even in this moment where their, you know, a private home had been violated, she showed this kind of agape love as what she personified. Um, you know, it, it's so powerful. And so our age needs a healthy slug of this. We're so reactive, yeah. so much yeah. toxicity, so much anger. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about Dorothy Cotton, another. Um, so Dorothy yeah. Cotton is really not very well known, although she should be. She, um, was a, a black American woman who uh, ended up leading the uh, Martin Luther King, but it was, was his idea, but it was, a, it was under the uh, organization and the careful, you know, strategic oversight of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference on, on basically the, the citizen schools. Um, and and she, she came to the SCLC under a guy named Wyatt Walker, who was the executive director of Burma Minister Joins in 1961, and very quickly becomes the only woman in King's inner circle. And so the kind of 
you know, running joke was whenever King was on the road, it was the doc. It was Andrew. It was Ralph Abernathy. It was Wyatt for a while. And then it wasn't Wyatt. And it was Dorothy. Um, and, and, and she became the, the, the fiduciary and leader of all these schools organized. Andrew Young had been doing this before Dorothy Cotton joined the Southern Christian Leadership Conference of organizing educational gatherings for people trying to educate them enough to register to vote in Jim, under Jim, stringent Jim Crow, crazy Jim Crow voting regulations, which I can say crazy now, except that we're living in an age when all kinds of people would like to reinstate these and are trying hard uh, to restrict voting access. And, and she became the, 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 the master teacher, the master administrator of this. And, and even after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, she continues doing this kind of work um, all across the South. She was also, this is just very, and she's, and, and by the way, for our viewers who may not know, she was very, very close romantically as well as strategically with Martin Luther King. And it was Coretta and she knew each other, knew of this. It was, it became part of the firmament of Martin Luther King's life. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting that a lot of people that have known her have written about in the civil rights movement have written about is that she was really what was called the, the, the voice of the civil rights movement. So people don't understand today that a lot of the, the fueling of resilience and, and organizing of connection and, and, um, and, and enlistment in these different campaigns, everywhere they went was singing. Mm. So song had it was kind of a gas tank. It was strategic. It was purposeful. The, and, and, the, and the ability to sing in groups, not just we shall overcome, but all kinds of songs that were that were literally part of a civil rights repertoire was something that she was in charge of and instigated. She had an amazing voice. And so on all these different fronts, you can see her typing up letters, teaching schools, calming for parishioners, you know, when the Klan is gathering outside the church, as happened in Montgomery, Alabama. In 1961, they're going to burn down the church to call to Bobby Kennedy from Martin Luther King to call out the National Guard, to keep all those people alive. Um, so there, you know, there she was everywhere and strong and brave and serious. And she wrote a wonderful uh, autobiography called If You're Called If Your Back Ain't Bent. Uh, this is really mixing time periods. And but in a fortune crisis, you talk about how um Ernest Shackleton, when he was interviewing sailors, uh, asked them to sing because he wanted to see kind of um, if they could muster up yeah. some sense of performance and care about who they were. And, uh, it's kind of a funny connection between that and the civil rights movement. It, it, it is, but think about it. Song is very, it's like laughter. It's very transporting, right? It's connecting. It connects us. It transports us. It can even, you know, I, I, have no, I don't have a very good voice, but I love I love the Anglican prayer service and because I get to sing all those great Anglican hymns and belt it out. And you do feel it is, it is inspiring. Let's put it that way. It's inspiring. And I think part of what Shackleton was looking for was, you know, uh, hiring for attitude and training for skill. Let's get those confident, aspirational people that are optimistic on this boat because it sure ain't going to be easy if we get to Antarctica. <laughs> uh, maybe my last question, more global yeah. one about women in the civil rights movement, because the histories that I've read. I mean, they they were, I mean, they were leaders in their own right. They played an incredibly important role, but there was a sense of second class citizenship yep. um, and the leadership. Um, I think there was not among all the members, not not among all the male members, largely black, but there were there were important white men, members of the civil rights movement. That was an important piece of the story. Was how we build a, a, an integrated society, uh, the tribal society that can live together. Um, I, I think there was, in general, that the women were like lots and lots of women even today in in a, in, a, in a largely all all boys world were fighting an uphill battle. Um, these women were like women today in those kinds of situations in many situations, just, you know, 30%, you, you choose your number, 30% more competent than the men, 30% more organized, 30% more caretaking, 30% more. And, and I, and I think over time in, in, at, at core, at SNCC, two of all these places, at Southern Christian Leadership, all of them, even with, even with some of the died in the wool, you know, old boys, so to speak, or misogynists among the among some of the civil rights movement. Not intentional, just part of the firmament, part of the game, part of the time, part of the culture. I think certainly Cotton, Fannie Lou Hamer, right? For the, everyone in the audience knows that name. Um, and there's a great biography coming out of her, of her in October. Mm -hmm. um, 
Diane Nash, these people earn their stripes and then and, and then some. Uh, and they they all exercised. Here's the key thing: they all exercised a lot of power, even if it wasn't titular, right? Struct it's structural in terms of where they sat in the organization, how much money they made. Right. Well, well, the lucky winner of your book. We only got one question or comment, and it's just oh. a comment. Uh, and the individual one to thank you for the tender description of Rachel Carson. You gave me a chance to reflect on my father, who was a chemical engineer and a naturalist by love, who died young from cancer. So, um, well, I'm sorry to hear about your father, but I'm glad. I'm glad that Rachel stirred up those yeah. those associations. She'd be pleased by that. Her spirit's pleased by that too. I'm sure. I always like to end with the words of our authors. So um, here's some uh, words from Nancy's book about Rachel Carson. In her larger leadership journey, Carson did more than simply identify critical problems and potential solutions. She also called others to their stronger selves, pointing them to a path of citizen awareness and action paved with humility and wisdom. She did all this with care, courage, dedication, and grace. Her life and work are indisputable proof of the enormous positive difference that one person can make. And we thank you, Nancy, for the positive difference you're making and your <laughs> writing and your teaching and uh, sharing this wonderful story. We look forward to reading the book about the civil rights leaders that you're researching now. And um, again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It was a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you, Tom. And thank you all for watching. I hope, again, you'll join us next week when uh, Tuesday night when we'll be with Congressman Laurie Trahan and we uh, have uh, five uh, young women high school students who are going to ask the congresswoman some questions. That's cool. That's great.